Uh, well, um, John Redwood is having an emotional night, rushing around on the telephone and listening to all these results, and no doubt waiting to see uh, what happens to his potential rival for the leadership, Michael Portillo. He was there at his count in Wokingham, where he's been constantly on the telephone and being congratulated, looking rather moved by his wife, Gail. So, we've had uh, other results in which we should look at. Perhaps the most striking, Mrs Thatcher's old seat, Finchley, taken by Labour. John Marshall defeated on a swing of 15%. Hartley Booth, who was there, was deselected. He was one of the first victims of the Back to Basics campaign, which uh, the Prime Minister, perhaps with hindsight, rather ill-advisedly ran and found a number of his MPs falling out of the wrong beds swiftly afterwards. Ilford South, a Labour win. Sir Neil Thorne is defeated there, a 17% swing. He held it before, Mike Gapes takes it for Labour. Labour gain Hendon, a swing of 16%. Sir John Gorst, who fought a feisty campaign there, including denouncing the Tory party, over the proposal to close Edgware Hospital after he'd been told, as he thought, that it wouldn't be. 16% swing. So the scoreboard now stands at Labour 299 up 77, the Conservatives on 39, that's up nine, down 97, and the Liberal Democrats on 24 up 16. And we're about to get this result, which we've been waiting for, from Enfield Southgate. Michael Portillo's seat. There's the count, and Lance Price is there, and we're waiting for Mr. Portillo, who, after all, if he doesn't, if he had won this seat, would have certainly been one of the prime contenders. We heard him earlier this evening speaking loyally about the need for the party okay, to stick to together, level. and it now looks as though he may not have got it. Lance, are you there? Yes, I am, and uh, at the moment, just out of shot there, the returning officer is giving the results to the candidates, uh, to Michael Portillo, to Stephen Twigg, his Labour opponent, who we understand, we believe, has won the seat. We can see Mr Portillo there now. Uh, once the returning officer has gone through the formalities of giving the result to them, they all knew the result uh, a few minutes earlier in any case, but this is the formal handing over of that result. They're now going up onto the podium for the declaration here in Enfield South. Well, this, is a, this Lance is a devastating blow for Mr Portillo if it is true that he's lost this seat because this was his one chance to take over the leadership of the Conservative Party and he's blown it by losing his own seat. It must be a really tough, uh, a tough moment for him. The look on his face as he's been you, going round in the past few minutes before this uh, count has been extraordinary. He obviously side. knows that his chances of taking Being over now are very slim. For the Enfield Southgate constituency held on the first day of May 1997, hereby give notice that the total number of votes recorded for each candidate at the election is as follows. Brown, Jeremy Richard, Liberal Democrat, 4,966. Luard, Nicholas Lamont, Referendum Party, 1,342. Malakuna, Andrew, Mal, Voice of the People, 229. Portillo, Michael Denzel, Xavier, thank you, ma'am. Conservative Party, 19,137. <laughs> Storky, Alan James, Christian Democrat, 289. Twig, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,507. Well, look at the face of Gillian Shepherd listening to these results Thank coming you, through, and watching the screen. And John ladies Redwood and in Wokingham. Please. Michael Portillo has lost the seat. Labour celebrates at the Festival Hall.
as the Thatcher favourite, one of the bastards in the cabinet, as Don Major called him. He was accused of plotting last time for the leadership, is defeated by young Please. Stephen He's Twigg. Newly elected Member of Parliament for the constituency. And Michael Portillo has a swing of 17.5% against him. He took this seat in a by-election just after 83, took a seat in a by-election, which is not that easy to do when the Conservatives were in power, and has lost it at the general election on a swing of 17, nearly 17.5%. So that ends one challenger for the leadership of the Conservative Party. The Defence Secretary is out. along with result after result across the country, demonstrates that there is no longer such a thing as a no-go area for the Labour Party. Can I thank you, Mr Mayor, and the police and all of the others responsible for ensuring the smooth and efficient running of the count and the smooth and efficient running of the election process here in Enfield Southgate. Can I thank all of the other candidates? We've had a good campaign here. We've had no dirty tricks here. We've had an honest, open debate in the Enfield Southgate constituency, and that's welcome. And can I finally, but most importantly, thank two groups of people, First of all, my agent Tony Watts and the rest of the campaign team in Enfield Southgate and those Labour supporters and members who came from outside Southgate to help, particularly over the last few weeks. And secondly, and most importantly of all, the 20,000 people who voted Labour in Southgate, those who voted Labour consistently through the difficult years as well as now through the good years for Labour, their loyalty and consistency has been repaid with this result. Thousands of first-time voters, thousands of people switching from other parties, especially the Conservatives, and certainly hundreds of Liberal Democrats who put aside their national preference, voted tactically for Labour to ensure a non-conservative victory. I pay tribute to all of them, and I will serve as the Member of Parliament for all of them, and indeed for all of the people who didn't vote for me as well. It's a good night for Labour. It's a good night for the country. You've all been here a long time, so you probably don't want to hear much more from me. We've got a long night to celebrate in the weekend as well, but thanks a lot. Michael Portillo, very punctilious, applauding uh, his Mayor, opponent, who's just defeated uh, him here in My first duty is to congratulate Enfield, Stephen Southgate. Twigg on his victory and say that uh, no one knows better than I what a great privilege it is to be the Member of Parliament for Enfield Southgate. He'll enjoy it very much indeed. I think he'll be a very good Member of Parliament, and I wish him well with it. Uh, we're obviously also going to have a new government. Government has to represent this country and do its best, and I wish the new government well to. It has been a great privilege to serve, and I thank all those people who made it possible for me for 13 years. In this election campaign, I'd like to thank Malcolm Tyndall, I'd like to thank all my supporters, and the Conservative Association that has supported me for all these years. A truly uh, terrible night for the Conservatives. Uh, I would have wished to have been part of rebuilding it inside the House of Commons. I can't now do that, but I would like to do whatever I can from the wings to help rebuild a great party which has a great future. One thing, one thing alone I will not miss, and that's all the questions about the leadership. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michael Portillo there, saying it's a terrible night for the Conservatives. At any rate, he doesn't have to answer questions about the leadership because he has been defeated and is out of the House of Commons. We're joined now by Gillian Shepherd, I hope, from Norfolk Southwest, the Education Secretary. Mrs. Shepherd, are you in trouble in your constituency? Well, they've only just started to count the votes, uh, but given tonight's swings, anything could happen. So you might well be defeated as well? Who could say? What do you make of the results so far? Well, clearly, as uh, Michael Portillo said, 
it's an enormously disappointing night for the government, for the Conservative Party. It's a particular blow that Michael has uh, so narrowly lost his seat. He will be enormously missed. And I so admired the typically graceful and elegant and indeed generous way uh, in which he just spoke. Do but you have, of course, he will be back. Do you have any idea why you've suffered this devastating defeat? Uh, well, uh, various theories have been put forward uh, on your programmes during the course of the evening. There is no doubt that when we think that the last Labour government was elected 23 years ago, uh, the electorate may well have thought it was time for a change. It is also certainly the case that the appearance that the parliamentary party has at times given over the past few years of being divided and of squabbling amongst themselves has not endeared us to the electorate. We've all had a lot of feedback, or I certainly have, from constituencies up and down the country and from my own, uh, of people who feel very critical of the parliamentary party, which has at times appeared to be concerned with its own internal politics rather than the Conservative Party in the country at large. So did, did you know even before yesterday that the game was up? No, I think most people would have said, and it was certainly uh, what I found, that the reception on the doorsteps was uh, uniformly uh, positive and pleasant. However, uh, clearly what we were all doing was merely sampling uh, opinion, and it is indeed um, a big night for the Labour Party uh, and uh, a big night for the government of this country. Thank you very much, Mrs. Shepherd. Thank you. And we'll hear your result. When do you expect your result to come through? Oh, lot, many hours to come. Many hours? Oh, many hours. What, tomorrow yes. morning? I shouldn't worry about it if I were you. No, no, <laughs> we'll be watching very, very closely. Thank you very much, okay. Jeremy. Okay, bye. David. Uh, Margaret Hodge, Stephen Twig, who unseated Michael Portillo, you're not going to pretend you expected him to do that. No, I don't think we didn't expect him to do so. I know him very well. He was my researcher until he very recently took up the secretaryship of the Fabian Society. And uh, in fact, it was a condition of his taking the job at the Fabian Society that he wouldn't then stand for Parliament. We knew he, was, we knew he had this seat that he was going for, but at that point, it seemed most unlikely that he'd win, he'd win it. It just shows the extent of uh, the Conservative defeat. OK, sloganising apart and point scoring apart, what is your explanation for what's happening tonight? I think it's, well, it's a number of things. I mean, I do think it is a final comment or a judgment on the Conservative government. I have to say it's the sleaze, it's the arrogance, it's the years of, of power. It is actually uh, se seeming to work in their own interest rather than everybody's interest. So there's all that sort of anti-conservative feeling which has finally borne fruit. And it's borne fruit because Labour has renewed itself. We are a new Labour Party. I think Tony Blair has done the most fantastic job in a very, very short period of time to really renew and regenerate the Labour Party so that it is in tune with the values of people today. Um, Ian Duncan Smith, you're a neighbour of, uh, of, of, of Michael Portillo. Does, does any of that ring any kind of chord with you at all? Because the discussion among Conservatives we've been having here so far has been all about you losing it rather than Labour winning it. Yeah, I think that uh, in Michael's case there were some demographic changes, so there were some other problems, but no, nobody expected Michael to lose his seat. I must also say that uh, no, nothing befits him so well as the manner of his passing. I thought the, the speech to me was gracious and showed great character, so, and I know he'll be back. It's just a matter of when. Uh, there is no explanation at the moment other than that the public has decided that they wanted a change. And I don't, uh, we'll have to decide what those reasons are, but there was a definite, they want a change. I don't think it was an overwhelming vote, I still don't think, for Labour. I think it was really a vote at the moment, devastatingly against us. Uh, Margaret Hodge, a uh, forecast majority of 187. You're looking at probably, I'm so sorry, I've got to stop there. We've got to, David. Jeremy, thank you very much. We go to Stevenage. Pro-Life Alliance, 196. You've got a result One from Stevenage. Nine, six. Corcroft, Andrew Brindley Michael, Natural Law Party, 110. 110. Coburn, Geoffrey Michael, the Referendum Party candidate, 1,194. One, 
1994. Follett, Daphne Barbara, the Labour Party candidate, 28,440. Now, a huge outburst of uh, support for Barbara Follett as she takes Stevenage from the Conservatives. High on Labour's target, this 37. Wilcock, Alexander Ian Cameron, Liberal Democrat, 4,588, 4588. Wood, Timothy John Rogerson, the Conservative Party candidate, 16,858. 16858. And that the said Daphne Barbara Follett has been duly elected to serve as member for the Stevenage constituency. So Barbara Follett takes that and we go down to Bristol West. William Waldegrave. Referendum party. And at this point we can say Labour has an overall majority, the 330 it needs. It's going to go way beyond that, of course, but it's got the 330 that it Charles needs. Boney, and there's William Aldergrave, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, looking rather gloomy on the right there. Jonathan Aitken has lost Thanet South. Thanet, incidentally, the seat that Cherie Blair stood for in 1983 Brearley, when Natural Jonathan Aitken held it for the Conservatives. 47. Valerie David Davy, Labour Party, 22,000. So William Walgrave defeated in Bristol West. His majority of 9,000 overturned. Majority of 9,000 overturned. And uh, Valerie David moves up from third place to take that seat. So we now have Labour heading for a vast majority. They've just passed the 330 mark, which gives them the certainty of being in government, but it's going to be much bigger than that, isn't it, Peter? Here's how Tony Blair has changed the history of the country for the last two decades. 1979, Mrs. Thatcher beat Jim Callaghan. Miss... David? Now there's the Piccadilly Circus flashing on the screen there, the Labour victory. And um, it'd be nice to see if there are any crowds there watching that, but perhaps there aren't. But John Major in Huntingdon hearing that result and knowing that all is up, he's at his count in Huntingdon. Peter, I'm sorry we <laughs> interrupted you at the end of an era. I don't think we can do better than Piggly Circus, but here we go anyway. Here's Mrs. Thatcher in the 1979 beating Jim Callaghan, beginning the 18 years of Conservative rule. She did it again, if you remember, with that huge majority of 144 in 83. That was the high watermark of Conservative success. Then the third one, uh, a little bit less, but still a convincing majority in 1987. Then John Major, the many people surprised, won the uh, election of 1992, the last one with a majority of 21, and now, that's all changed. The era of Conservative rule is over. There is Mr Blair with the most convincing majority. 187, a record Labour majority, bigger than any other majority since the war. He's got a larger lead over the Conservatives than any Labour party's had before, and the Tories are way down there with the worst share of the vote since 1832. It's a staggering Labour victory and the end of an era of British history. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, there's the result flashing over Piccadilly Circus. And as it does, we go down to find out what is going to happen in Wokingham to John Redwood. Gentlemen, he's won the seat. The glad he's about to news speak. of Conservative victory in Wokingham is, of course, tinged with sadness about the national result for all Conservatives. I am delighted that half of the electors of this constituency have put their trust again in me in the ballot box today. I will work hard on their behalf and on behalf of all my constituents, whatever they voted in this election. And I promise to all those constituents that I will faithfully perform my duties to the best of my abilities in the interests of the whole constituency. I would tonight like to thank 
all the returning officers staff for the excellent work they've done making sure that the local authority ballots don't get mixed up with the parliamentary and coming to a th such an excellent answer when they came to their counted conclusion. I would like to thank all the security staff and all the staff involved in this leisure centre for making it available tonight for this important night of our local democracy. I would like to pay a tribute to all the candidates in this election. I think we had a decent battle over the major issues. I certainly enjoyed putting the case across. I certainly enjoyed listening to what people had to say. And yes, we do need better schools. Yes, we do need to modernize our local hospital. And yes, we do need to make sure that Britain gets a good deal in Europe. Those were the messages from the doorsteps. Those are the messages I have clearly understood. Those are the messages that will carry me through this next parliamentary term. So thank you all. Thank you for an excellent result and an excellent contest. And I look forward to the next five years, making sure that Wokingham has a strong and good voice in the House of Commons. John Redwood speaking at his count. And it does now look as though there are going to be no Tory MPs outside England. It's uh, one Welsh seat they might hold, but we think they've lost it, which is Brecon and Radnor. That means there will be no Conservatives at all in Wales or in Scotland. Jeremy. David, well, I'm joined now from his count by Michael Portillo, who's just lost his seat there. Uh, when you were here at the start of this program, Mr. Portillo, you didn't look like a man who knew he was going to lose, did you? I didn't know it, but I thought it was possible. Why? Because there was obviously a very big swing underway. And now, what do you attribute that to? Um, I really don't know. I think, as I said to you earlier, that that needs quite a bit of uh, thinking out. Um, what I would say, I, re I said it earlier, was that the party was uh, pretty divided. And what I say now, for the first time I can speak without anyone suspecting me of having leadership ambitions or speaking to further my own uh, ambitions, I can now say that I plead with the party not to fall into disunity and opposition because that would be the way of staying there. Do you regret that you didn't stand for the leadership yourself? Uh, no, I don't actually. I, I thought uh, John Major was the right man to carry the leadership of the party. Um, and now it is, uh, it's come to what we see today. Uh, and I will do what I can to work from the outside to rebuild what is a great party. How can the party unite around the present policy on the single currency? Well, I'm now a man outside the House of Commons, so I don't have to bother with questions like that. I thought you just told the people at your declaration that you were going to work as, in any capacity you could to further the party. Jeremy, I'm taking an evening off. Listen, I will do what I can to bring unity to the party, but I'm going to do it by talking to the party, not by talking to you. Sure, but you, it follows from that, doesn't it, that you believe you cannot have unity around the present policy. Uh, it follows from that that the party needs to reflect very carefully about how it's going to move forward. Uh, and I very much hope that it will be united. Uh, and as I say, since I clearly have no axe to grind in this matter, I hope that my words may carry some weight in that respect. Is the present policy the right policy? Oh, Jeremy, do stop this nonsense. <laughs> well, I think we'll have to stop the interview unless you've got anything else you particularly want to tell us this evening. It was you who wanted the you interview. You do. This is your last opportunity, Mr. Portillo. <laughs> oh, not necessarily. We you seem see. very good humour for a chap who's lost his seat and his chance of leading the party. Well, I think it's, uh, it's inherent in politics that you have to be prepared for ups and downs. OK. Mr. Portillo, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks David, very much. We go straight to Exeter for the declaration. <laughs> Looks as though Bren, Ben Bradshaw has taken it for Labour. A very bitterly fought campaign between the Tory, Dr. Adrian Rogers, right winger, and Ben Bradshaw, who uh, openly homosexual and a lot of propaganda against him from Dr. Adrian Rogers during the campaign itself. Paul Anthony Edwards. Green Party. 643. Corinne Patricia Haynes. Independence. 638. <laughs> James Kenneth Meekin. Pensioners. 282. <laughs> David
David John Morrish, Liberal, 2062. Adrian Rudd Rogers, Conservative, 17,693. that Benjamin Peter James Bradshaw has been duly elected to serve as Member of Parliament for this constituency. So this is the seat that was held by the Tories by Sir John Hannam, and he's been defeated. He shakes hands even with the Conservative who made such bitter attacks on him. They both shake hands, like the unexpected moment that. The swing of 12% from Conservative to Labour. And Ben Bradshaw, former BBC reporter, becomes an MP. Night for Britain. It's a doubly historic night for Exeter. Because the people here have not just rejected the Conservatives and chosen Labour. They've rejected fear and chosen hope. And they have rejected bigotry and chosen reason. And for that, and for that, I want to thank them from the depths of my heart. I'd also like to thank the returning officer, all his polling station staff, the counters here in the hall, and the police. I'd like to thank the candidates from the Green Party, the old Liberal Party, the UK Independence Party, and the Pensioners Party for their clean and honourable <laughs> campaign. I'd like to thank my wonderful family and friends and my Huntingdon, partner, where Neil. the Prime Minister's declaration is about to come through. The very safe Conservative seat. It used to be the safest, but Alan Clark in Kensington and Chelsea now has the safest Conservative seat. The Prime Minister's seat has slipped a bit down the list, but still a majority of 22,000 at the last election. So he should be have no problems with holding that. Here he comes into the hall with Norma Major, the Prime Minister who's remained extraordinarily good humoured throughout this campaign despite the vicissitudes of the fight. He travelled around early morning till late at night and even when challenged at press conferences and in interviews and all the rest of it has always remained smiling with a Almost, some people said it was though he was freed by the campaign, but he certainly looked as if he was enjoying the campaign. And what he will do now is very uncertain. We shall have to wait to see whether we get from him tonight an acceptance of defeat or whether he waits until tomorrow, and then we have to discover whether he stands down, as must seem probable, from uh, the leadership of his party. And that will be read to you by the High Sheriff of Cambridgeshire, Mr David Rampley. I, David Temple Rampley, being the returning officer for the Huntington constituency, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. David James Bellamy, 3,114. Charles Raymond Coyne, 331. Veronica Hufford, 177. John Major, 31,501. James Owen, 8,390. Jason Reese, 13,361. Duncan John Robertson, 
89. And that John Major has been duly elected to serve as a member for the Huntingdon constituency. Mr. High Sheriff, I'd first like, uh, if I may, to congratulate all those who've carried out the uh, count of this very large constituency with uh, such skill and with such speed. I'd also add my thanks to all those who cared for the security of the polling booths throughout the day and manned them. It is a job that has been done, as we have come to expect in Huntingdon, with immense efficiency, and I'm very grateful to everyone who played their part in carrying that out today. I'd like also, if I may, to thank my fellow candidates in this constituency. I have been something of an absentee candidate, at least in the Huntingdon constituency, but I understand that the battle here has been fought with great courtesy and uh, great skill. And I congratulate all those who played a part in the campaign. I'm sure they will look forward to their future campaigns. I'd like also, if I may, to thank a number of people to whom I owe almost more than it's possible to express uh, readily and easily. Perhaps I may start with my agent, Peter Brown, a peer amongst agents. <laughs> Not only my agent, but a very old and dear friend, and I'm very grateful to him for all he has done, not just during this uh, campaign, but during recent years when he's perhaps had to undertake many burdens that perhaps would not normally have fallen upon the shoulders of anyone's agent. I'd like to thank also my constituency officers and the literally thousands of people who've worked in this constituency on my behalf during this campaign and over recent years. Their work has been immense. The affection I have for this constituency is not uh, easily expressed, but I think it is known by those people who live in the constituency, and I'm deeply privileged to have the opportunity of representing it yet again. Huntingdonshire has only had two members of parliament since 1945. I uh, have just been elected for the fifth time in this constituency, and I look forward with the same pleasure at serving my constituents in the future as I have found in doing so in the past. Above all, though, I'd like to express my thanks to Norma and to my family. Perhaps, perhaps these thanks are most appropriately expressed in private, but I think most people who have known Norma, most people who have seen her, will realize that not only has she graced this constituency for 18 years, I think she has graced a much larger stage in recent years, and my debt to her. And my, and my debt to her is one not easily paid. It is perfectly clear now that the Labour Party has had an extremely successful evening. I telephoned Mr Blair a little over an hour ago to congratulate him on his success and to wish him every good fortune in the great responsibilities that he will have in the years that lie ahead. This is a great country. He inherits a country in extremely good economic shape. I wish him every success in sustaining that in the interests of all the people of this country. I think I can promise that the Conservative Party will be a vigorous opposition. Where it is appropriate to support, we will support. Where it is in the interests of the country to support, we will support. Where we believe the policies are wrong, we will oppose vigorously, but honestly and fairly. But all that, I think, lies ahead for another day. For today, let me perhaps just add one further thought. Elections always have winners, and they always have losers. It is a very great occasion to win an election, a very great occasion to be elected to Parliament. Many colleagues and old friends of mine will have contested seats tonight and lost them. Many colleagues will have contested seats on behalf of my party this evening, contested them well and bravely, but lost them. I would like, if I may, to express to all of them uh, my thanks for all they've done on behalf of our country and our party. 
and my thanks also to the literally hundreds of thousands of people who have helped in the Conservative Party campaign and the millions of our fellow citizens who voted for the Conservative Party on this occasion. We are a great and historic party, the Conservative Party. We have had great victories in our time. We have had defeats in our time. We accept them both, I hope, with a certain dignity and a certain grace. Tonight, we have been comprehensively defeated. We will listen to the voice of the electorate. We will consider what has been said to us. I think we must reflect upon it. I know that we will, and I know when we have reflected, we will begin to prepare once again for that day in the future, I hope not too far distant, when my party may once again return to government in the service of this country. Thank you. John Major saying that he rang Tony Blair an hour ago and congratulated him on his victory and wished him well. I think well. must be the happiest... And, uh, paying a tribute to Norma Major, who actually during this campaign has been very popular going around with him. People have been asking to speak to her rather than him, according to reports, during the campaigning. There's been uh, a great support to him. Now we're joined for the second time tonight by Michael Heseltine, who's in Henley. Mr. Heseltine, when we talked before, we were talking and flirting with the idea, as so often in interviews with you, about the leadership of the Conservative Party. There's nothing much left to lead tonight, is there? Well, I think that there is always something to lead if you are a member of the Conservative Party because it is a party, as you well know and everyone knows, with a huge tradition, made a massive contribution to this country and with an instinct for government. I have not the slightest doubt that the battle will begun be to fight back and uh, that will be the instinct of the Conservative Party particularly as the arguments we put forward, the achievements to our credit, will stand the test of time. It's not tonight to refight the, the election campaign, but just because you lose the votes, it doesn't mean to say you've changed your mind about the arguments that you deployed. And I think you've heard John Major spell that out very clearly on behalf of the party in the interview that he's just given. Are there any, is there any one of your cabinet colleagues that you're particularly sad to have lost tonight? Well, it's a shattering situation to see people like uh, Michael Portillo and Malcolm Rifkin and uh, Ian Lang and uh, uh, Michael Forsyth, just to name the names immediately that come to mind, who have served uh, this country, uh, the, the government of which they're a member, uh, the Conservative Party, in such uh, a remarkably skilled and dedicated way, lose their seats. Uh, one is uh, uh, quite devastated by what has happened there. But I think if there's just one other thought, uh, they'll be back. But what do you say to those Tories who remain, the 160-odd that are going to be in the House of Commons and to your supporters around the country, about what happens now? Is it going to be led by somebody like yourself who can bring the party back together again or thinks they can? Well, I think that it will be led by John Major. And you really? Uh, yes, I do. I think you don't that, think he's um, going to stand down? I don't see any indication of that. And I believe that uh, uh, in the interview he gave, he was giving you the, uh, certainly the impression I got that uh, uh, conversations would take place, discussions and analysis, uh, in which he was intending to play a full part. And I'm sure that everybody would welcome that. What is your reaction to the defeat of Neil Hamilton in Tatton? Uh, well, I think that that's best left for the history books. Why do you say that? Because I don't see why you think I should comment on something like that, which is for Neil a personal tragedy. It's happened. Uh, you can have a judgment, I can have a judgment, but I'm not going to be drawn on that. I feel sorry for the man and for his wife in these circumstances. Do you think it was one of the factors that made it difficult for the Tories tonight or, or an irrelevancy? Well, I think that uh, there is an argument which I would subscribe to, that there were incidents in a number of cases in uh, the last parliament which uh, it's very difficult to think of a prime minister who has uh, had so many examples of bad luck quite outside his own control as those that uh, affected John Major. Mr. Heseltine, thank you very much. Thank you. Jeremy. I'm joined now by Sir Edward Heath from his council Bexley Bexley and Sidcup. Um, Sir Edward, what do you judge went wrong? In the whole of the election campaign? Yes. Well, I think it goes much further back than that. And uh, it showed that in some cases we were out of touch with people. And we were also pursuing policies which they didn't accept.
specifically which? Well, I think myself that to put forward a complicated pension scheme a fortnight before the campaign began was unwise. Uh, it's difficult for people to understand and they immediately became worried about it as elderly people do tend to be. And so that was uh, an action which didn't need to be taken at that particular time and could have been held back. How much do you think there was a question of lack of confidence in the leadership ability of the Prime Minister? I mean, you said he should have sacked those ministers who questioned the government line. Uh, I would have preferred him to have done that. When and the same applies to the questions which arose over, quote, sleaze, quote. Hamilton should never have stood at this election. Do you think now that Mr. Major can continue as leader of a party that's divided from top to toe as yours is? No, our job now is to review very thoroughly the present situation and how it's developed. We had to do this in 1945, directly after the defeat of the party after the war. We had to do it in 1964. We'd had 13 years in power. And uh, Alec Douglas Hume told me to organize a complete review, which we did. And we said, this isn't just to justify what we've done in the past. What we've got to do is look quite impartially at it and say, well, was what we did justified? And was it successful or not? And if it wasn't, then scrap it and uh, think out new policies to deal with the present situation. So you're saying right back to the drawing board? Yes, absolutely. That doesn't mean to say that you will scrap everything which we've had in the past, but you will analyze it very carefully and decide whether it's right to continue with it. Sir Edward, thank you very much. David. Well, uh, Peter, perhaps we should have a look now at how Labour is doing. They've almost scored every hit they needed, haven't they? I, and I, more. Well, I think one or two exceptions. But the devastating thing about this Labour victory is the way they've hit so effectively uh, in the areas that they needed to do it in. I mean, up in the Scottish and the North areas and the, and the Wales and so on, the swing has been nothing like as big as it has been down in this devastatingly important area to them in the south where all those Tory marginals are 14 percent I mean it's a record-breaking swing by any standard since the war 14 percent swing in the south and in London uh, 11 percent there uh, in places like the Midlands and the result of that is that when we look at our targets and we see how well Tony Blair's party's aim has been it is absolutely devastating particularly in these clusters down here still a few results to come let me just uh, Lose, lose the ones that haven't yet been declared. You can see there, these are the safer, uh, these were the safer Tory seats, so seats like Portsmouth North uh, here, and for example, Dumfries in Scotland, and these ones, like uh, the Vale of Glamorgan, were very unsafe, very small Tory majority before. Now, as we fly around, uh, watch the hits here clocking up in the little hit box. The first one we're going for is Plymouth Sutton, then Exeter, you can see just beyond it there. There goes Exeter. Here comes Portsmouth North, the most difficult of those targets to hit. You can just see Simon Hughes surviving in the middle of London, but surrounded by those great skyscrapers of red in London. So one Liberal Democrat survives, uh, but otherwise just devastation everywhere. And huge Labour majorities building up where those powerful Tory majorities were before. Sterling in uh, Scotland, Michael Forsyth seat going up there, the last one. And you can see there that, yes, the uh, Welsh nationalists have survived in Ceredigion, uh, and also Simon Hughes, of course, uh, in London. But otherwise, it's going to be 98 hits on that target and two misses only. David. Thanks, Peter. Uh, not all Tory ministers have, um, have uh, taken the, the plunge tonight or walked the plank. Folkestone and Hythe, for instance, Michael Howard with a split opposition from Liberal Democrats and Labour held on there, 20,000 for him, 13, 14,000 for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, John Aspinall, incidentally, the zookeeper, who's the referendum candidate there, doing rather well, getting 8% of the vote in Folkestone and Hythe, but the Home Secretary holds it, 6,000 majority. Not quite yet the former Home Secretary. Hitchin and Harpenden, Peter Lilly, Secretary of State for Social Security. He gets a very big swing against him, but it's a safe seat. 15% swing against Peter Lilly, but he holds on to the seat. Uh, Fergus Walsh is in Charnwood, Stephen Dorrell's seat. We haven't yet had his declaration, but Fergus, what's your impression of how he's reacting to the news? First of all, of the disappearance of one or two of the potential rivals, and second, what kind of party it is there left to lead? 
Well, sources very close to Mr. Dorrell are saying there should be a leadership election in July, that Mr. Major should carry on for the moment, signal his intention to stand down, but hold on to give time to regroup, to give time for people to discuss what went wrong. Um, there are Tory party rules which say that after a general election, there should be, uh, if there is a leadership election, not before three months and not after six months. And uh, sources close to Mr. Dorrell say it would be within the spirit of that to hold a leadership election in July. Well, now, why do you think he wants that? Does he see that as an advantage to him and, uh, and, and not to his rivals? Absolutely, because it would give him time to uh, group his supporters together. Of course, Mr. Redwood's been out of the cabinet for some time now, so his, his bandwagon will roll pretty quickly. Um, but Mr. Dorrell is saying also, or Mr. Dorrell's sources rather, are saying that uh, what we need to do is analyse here what went wrong, why the message went so badly wrong on the doorstep. And uh, Mr. Dorrell's sources are saying that there were really three major factors that went wrong here. First, the time for a change. Nothing really they could do about that. Secondly, continuing hurt from the recession. And thirdly, the mixed up message on Europe. Fergus, thanks very much indeed. We just uh, have heard that the Prime Minister is going to Buckingham Palace at 11.30 in the morning. Our cameras will be there. We'll be following it, of course, um, to uh, hand in his resignation. Uh, and Tony Blair will follow within the half hour or so. By midday, we shall have a new Prime Minister. Uh, Anne Perkins is uh, with, uh, at John Redwood's count and has been talking to him. Let's hear from John Redwood, who won his seat in Wokingham. Well, I'm joined now by John Redwood, whose uh, swing against whom was only 6%, a good deal less than the national average. But you said two years ago, no change, no chance nationally. Do you think you've been proved right? Well, I take no comfort in that. Uh, I was worried two years ago that we would not win the next general election, and I did think then changes were necessary. Uh, but I'm just very pleased that the voters of Wokingham have backed me again for another parliament. I'm very pleased that about half of them did support me. Obviously disappointed, I've lost the support of some of them, and I will just work very hard over the next five years to try and win them over. You've also lost an awful lot of your friends in Parliament, an awful lot of people have gone. Why? Why is this result so bad for the Conservatives? It is a very sad night indeed for the Conservative Party. And yes, I'm very upset for a lot of my friends in Parliament who served their constituents very well, who with their colleagues have worked very hard in this election campaign and will no longer be able to serve in the next Parliament. Okay. I don't think it's time yet for explanations. Tonight is about results. It's about finding out who has won and who has lost. But you must have a gut instinct about what was wrong with the way the campaign was being fought. Well, I want to look at the overall results yeah. in the light of morning and think what would be right to say. I don't think it's sensible to rush off tonight with all sorts of explanations when the party is obviously extremely upset by the results and when we need to pull together and when we need to rebuild ourselves as a decent force in opposition. But can you not put your finger, I mean you here ran a, a, a campaign focused very tightly on, on education, on health, on Europe. Uh, d surely you could say whether or not you feel those were the issues that should have been hit nationally. Well they were right for my campaign here uh, because we do seem to have had less severe a swing against us. And we did feel that people were very interested in those three big issues, health, education and Europe. And that on health and education they needed reassuring that we were going to spend enough in the future, that we had been making changes for the better. And on Europe, they wanted reassuring that we were not going to take them into a federal super state. Uh, with a Blair-led government, it will now be tr most important for Conservatives to make sure that Mr. Blair does not give away powers to govern this country that we will need in the future. Do you think John Major can survive this result? I'm not commenting on anything like that. Uh, John Major is the leader of the Conservative Party and you should allow him time to consider what is best for the Conservative Party. Do you think leadership talk during the campaign damaged the campaigning effort? I have no further comments on the campaign. Uh, I'm just very pleased that in Wokingham people have backed me again and I will work very hard over the next five years to earn their trust. Anne Perkins with John Redwood. And now it's time to hear again from our roving reporter at large, Frank Skinner. Hello, I'm at the Thursday night dance at Podsey Civic Hall in West Yorkshire. And look at this, Tony's tipple. They are for any Labour supporters who are here tonight. And there's a picture of um, Sarah Brighton for some strange reason. But there's a slogan on the side, look, Labour's coming home. It's a clever slogan. I wonder where they got that idea. So I'm just going to ask a couple of dancers. Hello. Uh, Hello. Now, I don't know if you've heard the news, because you've been dancing all night, I imagine. Yeah. Um, 
apparently in Ibra are doing quite well. Keep moving, it's all right, I can stick with you. <laughs> um, yes. Oh. Is that good news? Is it, is, is, is it unfortunate? Yeah. Right, so you, you'll be, you voted Conservative, I take it. Right, OK. Well, it's not definite yet. I mean, you still, you know, live in hope. So what do you think of Mr Blair? He's OK. He's understood it's a problem. Right. Mr Prescott. Oh, yeah, you don't like him. Yeah, bloody does. Can he not dance? <laughs> Fun? I don't know if he can or not. I've noticed that neither manifesto mentioned come dancing, whether that was going to keep going or not. So <laughs> that wasn't very good, was no, it? No, no, no. So basically, you're more Lionel Blair than Tony Blair, is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Nice to talk to you. Hello. Hello. You're right. Yes, sir. Now, um, I don't know if you've heard any news, but the the prediction is that um, Labour might well get in tomorrow. Is that good news? No. Yeah. Is it? Oh, it's a bit of a bit of a split. Oh dear. Yeah. Are you are you married? No. We were. Oh, right. Oh, you didn't split up over politics, I hope. No, no. Couldn't even agree on that. No, we didn't. So, what do you think of Mr. Blair? I think he's a nice guy. I, you know, I think he's a nice guy. Nice enough guy and everything, but... Um, I don't think he'd make a good Prime Minister. No. He'd have made a good ballroom dancer, wouldn't he? Because he's got that fixed smile yeah, that ballroom yeah. dancer. You know he's that? He's very nice. He's very nice, <laughs> cheeky. Yeah. Oh, he's cheeky. Cheeky smile. Yeah. But we need a cheeky prime minister, don't you think, Do you for think a change? Because so? John's—he's a nice bloke, John, but he's not cheeky. No, he is. They're all the same. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. yeah. They, they say what they want to think. Yeah, I suppose you're right. They say what we, what we want to think, you know. Yes. And then you change your mind. Yes. I think you. That's Anyhow. so true. Anyway, yeah. don't let me stop you dancing. And thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Okay, okay cheers. So there you are. The public of Podsey have spoken. Frank Skinner, they're reporting, and uh, he'll be back later on. He's wearing around the country tonight. Now, let's come back to the business in hand. Some labour gains. First of all, Thanet South. Jonathan Aitken, who resigned as Chief Secretary of the Treasury so that he could pursue a legal action against the Guardian, has been defeated in, Than in Thanet South, it's rather difficult to say that, isn't it, by 15% swing. Richmond Park, a Liberal Democrat gain, Jeremy Hanley defeated, this is Richmond in Surrey, it's been renamed Richmond Park. The Liberal Democrats have been hankering for that seat for a long time, and Jennifer Tong takes it from the junior minister, briefly chairman of the Conservative Party, Jeremy Hanley. Hastings and Rye, a Labour gain. They come from third place to top place. Jackie Late defeated. She's been there since 92. First woman whip for the Tory party. Labour gain St Albans. A swing there of 15%. David Rutley defeated. And Kerry Pollard again coming up from third position. And Tory and Liberal Democrat 4-1. So again, a Good night for Labour in St Albans. The state of parties now. Let's just have a look at that. Just coming up to 10 to 4. And we've had 505 results in. 373 Labour, well past the 330 seats they needed for an overall majority in the new House. Up 123 so far. The Conservatives hanging way back on 90. Down 146. The Liberal Democrats on 31 up 19 and they're doing well tonight. National parties up three, others up one. And the forecast based on those 506 results now with 153 to come, a new house of 659 in all, a Labour majority of 187, the biggest ever Labour majority. It's hard to see how they're all going to fit onto the government benches in the House of Commons. Peter Snow will no doubt be demonstrating for us soon how difficult it will be. Conservatives are heading for the lowest seats total since 1906. Liberal Democrats predicted to achieve their best third party results since 1929. Here are some of the key losers tonight. One of the people who hope to challenge for the leadership of the party, perhaps, Michael Bultillo, the Defence Secretary, defeated. Malcolm Rifkin, the Foreign Secretary, out. Ian Lang, the Trade Secretary, defeated. Michael Forsyth, the Scottish Secretary. William Rawlgrave, Treasury Secretary, and Norman Lamont, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, having a stab at Harrogate, defeated. David Mellor in Putney out. Jonathan Aitken, a former minister, out. Sir Marcus Fox, chairman of the Backbench 1922 Committee, defeated. The man who would have organised the leadership 
uh, election if John Major stands down and the Social Security Minister Alistair Burt. And a win for Martin Bell in Tatton. As independent, we'll be hearing from him in a moment. Tony Blair, the Labour leader. The support that's been given to us tonight has been given so that we can build one country, one nation, one society. And John Major, the Prime Minister, tonight we've been comprehensively defeated. We'll listen to the voice of the electorate and reflect on it. Michael Portillo said, this is a truly terrible night for the Conservatives. I would have liked the chance to help rebuild the party. He being outside the House of Commons now and says he will do what he can from the wings. Kenneth Clark, Chancellor of the Exchequer, for us to fall into mutual recriminations would be folly. We've got to pick ourselves up and lose with dignity from a possible challenger for the leadership when that battle comes. And this is how the news came to us during the night. These are the highlights of a very dramatic turnaround in British politics, the most dramatic scenes we've seen certainly since the war. Stevenage, the Follets appear to be about to celebrate their victory there with a Grand Prix size bottle of champagne which won't open. Well, there we are. I think the thing to do is shake it and, and just see if the cork will pop out. It's going to be the most terrible explosion in a moment. This is the agony of celebrating victory in Stevenage. This is the most interesting photo opportunity of the entire election campaign. Ken Follett there, the very successful writer. I think it's time to listen to a chorus of things can only get better from the festival hall and leave them to their fate in Stevenage. They're obviously be better off with orange juice. Dee Ream playing the song that they played right through the campaign that drove people on the campaign bus mad. Needless to say, this is La Labour's celebration while extra hands are brought in to Stevenage to try and open the court. We'll, we'll, keep, you, we'll keep you abreast of Stevenage as the night goes on. They were, called, they were called champagne socialists, but they're clearly very incompetent champagne socialists. Perhaps they're not really champagne socialists at heart at all. The Follett family are quite incapable of opening a bottle of champagne. We'll go back there during the evening as, 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 it, as it... No, it's broken. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Right. 
Francine, Francine Stock from the Royal Festival Hall. I hope the Labour Party there is being rather more successful. There have been no, no problems whatsoever in opening these champagne bottles here and it's flowing very freely. As you can hear behind me, things have definitely warmed up since we had that set from Dream. And there's a lot of dancing, a lot of singing, actors and actresses, people from the world of entertainment, all sorts of people piling in. And now the first of the heavyweights from former Shadow Cabinet now part of the government itself, Robin Cook is with me. Good evening. Good evening, Robin no, Cook. No, nobody's going to call Ken and Barbara champagne socialist ever again after that performance. <laughs> you, never in your wildest kind of projections would you have imagined a majority this large? No, I mean, I did get into trouble for saying the word landslide six weeks ago. I guess I can use that word safely now, but none of us ever imagined that it was going to be on this scale. And I, was, I find myself both tremendously encouraged but moved by the trust which the British people have put in the new Labour Party. And we must now work hard to make sure we deliver on that trust. But no doubt about it, the biggest cheer of the evening here came when Mr Mortillo lost his seat. I mean, there's also, it is a rejection vote as much as an endorsement of you. Oh, I think what happened tonight is a reflection of three things. First of all, the tremendous leadership of Tony Blair, who has shown the world that he can lead the Labour Party, and Britain now wants that leadership in charge number 10. Secondly, Labour fought on the issues that affect the lives of the real people out there, health service, education, jobs. And thirdly, yes, the country looked at the Tory party, they saw a divided party with a weak leader, and they recognised that such a party is not fit for government. So here you are with a much, much larger majority than expected. How is that going to affect the complexion of the future Labour government? Well, first of all, it is not going to affect the policies in which we fought this election and in which the people have given us a mandate. As Tony Blair has said, we will deliver on what we promise and we will repay the trust of British people by sticking to our word. Uh, as to the future, of course, it will be very valuable to us to have what I think anybody's going to recognise as a working majority. OK, thank you. And uh, we're back with us now. And, but is it surely not going to mean that you could be, can it, will it mean you could be more radical? More radical? Well, Tony Blair has already said that in government, we may be more radical than people think, but by that he meant that people had not fully grasped just how much our policies add up to. We are going to deliver a just society based on fairness. We are going to deliver an economy in which there's opportunity for the many, not privilege for the few. And we're going to deliver a renewed democracy which brings power back to the people. That's a radical package, but it is a radical package in which we fought this election. Robin Cook, thank you.